This is a special occasion because this is the first time that I've ever had a guest on twice on the show. Um, Eric Feigelding and I spoke a few months ago when the COVID crisis was really starting back in March. New York was getting absolutely hammered. But uh, we had a bit of cautious optimism as to the late but hopefully effective uh, plans in the United States for dealing with the virus. And now we're back here to talk about it once again. If you don't know who Eric is, uh, as I've mentioned in the previous, in, in the previous episode, he's a uh, senior fellow at the Federation of American Scientists, which is a nonpartisan think tank in D.C., He's a world-renowned epidemiologist, and maybe most importantly in this case, was the, arguably the first person who sounded the alarm on COVID-19 in the United States all the way back in January when all of us should have been listening. So, Eric, thank you so much for, for coming back on the show. Thanks. Happy to be here. So, here we are. Three months later, everything was shutting down last that we talked. As I said, New York was getting bombarded, but the rest of the country looked good. How's America doing now? America's doing much worse. And it's uh, actually, we actually didn't really get much better, um, surprisingly. I just, you know, New York, New Jersey, and New England decline. But if you subtract out those states, U.S. never actually had a dip outside of those states. U.S. has been pretty much climbing uh, steadily um, ever, since, um, ever since March. And that's what's really sad. I think the U.S., is actually getting worse in many ways and exponentially worse very recently. It's interesting because we seem, it seems like we're the only first world country that's actually getting worse. Even places that we kind of were laughing at last we talked at their lack of response or how bad it was seem to have flattened the curve and be declining. Why do you think it's the case that Europe is doing, I wouldn't say well, but, but certainly improving and we are not. Yeah. Europe as a whole is doing amazingly better. Um, Sweden still has a pretty high mortality. No surprise. Multiple, multiple fold higher. As you know, they, unlike their Scandinavian neighbors, they took the plow through approach to chase this mythical herd immunity without the vaccine, which you're never supposed to chase without the vaccine. Uh, without vaccine. So UK, it's on the downward trajectory, but uh, it's, you know, Scotland is much, Scotland is approaching zero while lower England is not. Um, but as a whole, Europe is doing well. And in certain ways, Europe is a, sh is a union, but uh, they have borders. Like Italy can shut its borders from France, from, from uh, Switzerland and, and um, Slovenia and Austria. But uh, US, we don't. You know, if New York Governor you know, Cuomo decides to put a blanket travel uh, quarantine rule on travelers from these Sunbelt states, yes, but how are you going to enforce? Are you going to put checkpoints on the hundreds of borders? Yeah, thousands of roads, right? Yeah, thousands of roads. And if, what if someone's just passing through? There's no way to enforce that in the U.S. There's no such thing as borders. And so U.S., it's like a big ship in which... There's no bulkheads. Normally ships, you can, if the forward uh, uh, compartment is flooding, you can bulkhead it off. We can't bulkhead anything off because we're so fluid of a country. And so if, you know, if there's 30 holes, there's 33 states with double digit increases in the past week. If we fl plug half of them, um, we're still going to keep flooding. And that's the problem in which we're at in the U.S. right now. That was my favorite analogy that you offered on the uh, on the last time we spoke, and I was going to ask you about that, which was the the leaky ship, and it's so accurate, and it's, uh, it, I mean, you had such foresight in in saying it three months ago because it, it is exactly what we're seeing happen. I think it's really funny that people, at least politicians, and a lot of people on social media talk about this second wave. And it seems like they don't understand how a wave works. I mean, in my opinion, this is still a massive first wave that's rolling through and we can't even talk about a second wave yet. Is that the case or is what we're seeing a second wave? Yeah, it's the second peak of the first wave. Right. Um, it's definitely not the second wave because if you actually look at it, a lot of these Sunbelt states, they never really had a New York, you know, big first wave. And then they're up. These were the Sunbelt states. They have kind of like a dip but this is their first real trajectory rise. So 
you can either call a second peak a first wave or it's the first wave for the for these oh. other states that were not right, for like the whole the, country the first wave is sort of yeah. rolling through if yeah, new york and, had and another if, through, if, yeah, yeah it really is rolling through the country and new york is now on the downward trajectory but clearly there's still there's some people say like oh new york has fought it off um new york has reached herd immunity that is not true at all we just know that new york has been much more aggressive and in, in certain ways um if you look at other countries like Singapore rebounded from zero. Uh, Israel, Israel had like this huge curve down to almost zero, reopen, and now they're back up again. So, right. and, and you can say what you want about Israel, but Israel is one of the most um, tightly knit countries in terms of enforcement of any rule. And yet here they are as well. So no one, no one is immune. And California, you know, had its initial small wave, and now it's clearly popping back up. So the big question that a lot of uh, parents are certainly asking now <laughs> um, is what happens in August? What happens for school? It seems there's a lot of studies starting to come out. Uh, perhaps some of it is anecdotal, but because Europe has opened to some degree and their kids have gone back to school and they haven't really seen spikes among the kids, it seems that there may be some emerging evidence that children do not really transmit it uh, to, to their parents or to adults or to each other, and that really maybe it's the teachers and staff that are at risk. Is that true? What is the evidence of that? Because if it is, obviously, that's like the amazing silver bullet for every parent who's praying that they can like send their kids to the but grandparents kids, and those things. So kids do get infected. Um, there are some studies that say it's slower, but I've seen other studies in which kids are infected at the exact same rate as adults. And kids, and I think a new study came out that kids transmit the virus just the same. And I think people are confusing that kids don't get sick as much. That's true. But they carry it all the same, just like young people. Young adults don't get sick that much and go to the hospital and die that much. Some do, of course. Right. But they keep, they are the, uh, the outbreak carriers. Like in these analyzed 61 clusters of outbreaks, 61 outbreaks. And they found that young adults, 20 to 29, were the largest plurality of the initiators of each of the clusters. So, and we see that now. A lot of the transmission is in young adults under 35. And the mortality is not increasing, first of all, because there's a lag, but it will also require them to transmit it to more vulnerable adults, right. either elderly or not just elderly, but also those with diabetes, immunocompromised diseases, heart disease. Heck, obesity is a, is a risk factor. And you know how many Americans are obese. And so all these things, the, 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 the universe of vulnerable people is a lot bigger than people think. It's not right. just the 70, 80 year olds. Right. That, yeah, that, that's such a insane myth. Uh, and also it's so dismissive and just like petty to say, well, it's only old people, let them stay inside or let the old people yeah. die. I mean, it, it just blows my mind that that's even a sentiment yeah. that's, I was just on an interview today and you know, there was this other conservative commentator who said, well, we just need to shield our elderly. It's just a shielding. We'll, we'll approach, we just, we can go out and get infected. It's okay. As long as we shield our, our elderly, that is so narrow uh, to, uh, vision because there's so many other risk factors that put people at risk and the risks actually jump pretty quickly between 30 and 40 and 50 years old. So that's the large, largest working population. It also implies that like people who are in their 60s and 70s should be spending their golden years away from their grandchildren and locked yeah. in a house, which to me is just like, well, I'll do anything to, to get my parents out of their house. If you tell me that I have to like wear a unicorn helmet, I'll do that, right? If it works, it really doesn't matter. And so to hear people that dismissive of the older population, it's really just a, it's like a different kind of world than it was in their generation, I think, where they, you know, the greatest generation in World War II and fighting these wars, they would do anything for each other. And now we're in this world where people just dismiss anyone that's not themselves. It's very selfish. Yeah. 
uh, and I, I cannot agree more. Um, I, I, this rugged individualism of the United States and this selfish individualism is really great in some sense, but terrible for pandemics because pandemics requires collective action, collective you know, community protection. My mask protects you, your mask protects me. But that collectivism is socialism. Um, and it, it's, it's, it, you don't even have to make it partisan. It's, it's caring for your neighbor. And the other key thing I, I get annoyed with is, you know, on both sides of the aisle, sometimes there's a schadenfreude. It's like, ooh, they're going to that rally. Ha, ha, ha. Let's, and then someone throws up a, a Darwin meme in which right. he's pushing. And, and I'm realizing that there is this, the schadenfreude is, is destructive because, you know, they could get infected, but they could be your neighbor. Or right. they could be your your parents' neighbor, and in the end, we all lose. Especially since um, our goal is we don't just want to protect our elderly, which this epidemic is already killing off at huge rates. But we want to protect our next generation, and to protect them, we want them to go to school. And I think the biggest best argument is: look, protect everyone. Don't get political about this. Um, and the ultimate goal is so that our children can go to school and our children do not become this developmentally damaged, scarred generation in which they're out of school for a year and a half. That's the best message, I think. Yeah, and would it be a year and a half? Or if there's, you know, the, the, I guess that it speaks to like, when does this end? If we continue on the same path, and like you said, uh, herd immunity actually somewhat requires a vaccine. Maybe there won't be a vaccine. Maybe the vaccine will be like a flu shot that's only partially effective. You know, what is the end game there if we are trying to send our kids back to school or trying to get any sort of normal, normal life going if we don't take further steps? There will be an end game. The end game is the vaccine. And there will be many vaccines. Some Fauci expects will be 70% effective. Some right. we're hoping will be 90, 95% effective. And I'm hoping for the 90, 95% because we know a huge population of our current state uh, does not want to do that. They're not going to take them. They're not going to take them. And, right. and that's really sad. And because um, in certain ways, like you not taking them actually hurts the, all of us because there is a lot of elderly immunocompromised people with organ transplants, with immunity diseases who um who are you know medically can't take them but now you're actually endangering them as well so it's like a social responsibility thing but clearly there's this anti-vaxxer movement that's it's very upsetting but that's why i'm saying we need a vaccine that has probably 90 95 percent so we didn't count we can account for those who don't and if it's not effective enough you have to combine it with masks plus the vaccine and hopefully that will get the R low enough that it will eventually taper off and disappear. Right. But a 70% effective vaccine does not get our parents out of their houses. It will Ever. be very <laughs> slow in containment. I think 70% will be good enough if we combine it with masks. Um, well, right. But we can't even get people to wear masks now. I know. Our without a vaccine. Control. Our current compliance in masks is, again, I think this is why New York City and um, Massachusetts have much lower rates because they're, they've seen the virus up close, right? And therefore, people wear masks much more vigilantly. And America ha has this, and anyone has this kind of reality. You have to see it to believe it. If they haven't seen or know someone who has gotten sick or died, they don't take it seriously. And right. if they know no one, they think it's a hoax or it's overblown. And I think that is the, where the disparity, this is why the wave is traveling to the South, where those were the areas that were least seeded by the initial European and Asian travel, um, but, and didn't see that many cases and didn't take the mask wearing seriously and reopened very aggressively, obviously. Um, but New England is keeping it low because they are the most vigilant. They have the highest prevalence of mask wearing. And I think mask wearing will make the ultimate difference here. 
So how did masks become such a political issue then? If it's such an obvious thing and it's so simple, why did it become such a political issue and why do we have that issue here? I think, th- I think historians and um, sociologists will have to study this in detail because this is one <laughs> of the most pressing questions of how the hell did we get here? Um, you know, there is some truth that there was early confusion about masks. There was. There was. And, and early on, what they were trying to do is they were actually trying to pre- preserve N95 respirator masks for healthcare workers. And that's why they say, don't hoard masks. You don't need masks yet. But obviously, that message was misinterpreted. And, you know, they were wrong initially in terms of this the importance. Now we know how important. But I think now it's gotten political as in um, it becomes a sign of manliness because, you know, the macho where you are, yeah, you, you, know, a pull, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a sign of masculinity, macho is tough guyness. I'm not sheep. Um, and come on, it, it's the, it's a small, it's a really petty thing, but how did it get here? I don't know. I think there might be some misinformation campaigns out there too. Um, Cause there's yeah. lots of bad actors out there that are trying yeah. to who want to throw grenades and watch the world burn. And I yeah, think it would benefit those, tremendously from seeing the yeah. United States struggle. Yeah. As, they, as there's a lot of people who have shot in Freud at watching America burn. And I think, you know, like there's also like this weird misinformation with carbon dioxide poisoning. And I was just going to say it's the weirdest thing in the world. That yeah. is the weirdest thing because if that was true, surgeons would be being po- poisoned every single day. And that's just not true. <laughs> right? Welders. <laughs> Welders. <laughs> Anyone who, you know, um, work in a shop and has to, you know, work with wood and the wood dust and everything. It's just not true. Uh, it's the most easily debunked thing, but, and it's oftentimes coming from these like biblical groups. You you saw some of these city council um, testimonies and it's really, I live in Florida, sadly. So yes, I, I it's also in Orange County. (laughs) It's also in Orange County too. It's, it's many places. And I think like, there's no, there's not many people pushing that. Like it's an easily refuted falsehood. So I think there must be some disinformation campaigns out there. Again, I'm speculating, but it is so strange because no one would be really pushing that. And it's so easily refuted because you can wear a mask and measure right, your pulse box. And there's been videos on this and it's Yeah, people wearing different. five masks and wearing a pulse oximeter and still having like a 99. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, it's such an absurd uh, assertion that it's almost hard to understand, as you said. But... You know, you said that uh, some of that early information was misinterpreted. I do remember that the U.S. Surgeon General flat out said, don't wear a mask. You don't yes, need them. I remember they, that. Right. So, Jerome Adams was so, a little bit too emphatic on that. Right. So in a country where people, you know, uh, basically read a headline and form a permanent opinion, which is what happens here, right? You know, you never see a lot of people don't seek further information once they have their confirmation bias or they hear what they want to hear. And so they'll look and say that, you know, the CDC, Surgeon General, WHO, they all said, don't wear a mask. And they don't even, they don't want to hear any new information on it. So there is some responsibility, I think, with, you know, the the medical community at the top for this problem. I do agree. I think it was, it, it's a, cla- it will be, again, one of the classic examples of how the I would say, not drop the ball, they failed to look around the corner and failed to be very precise in messaging. Like oftentimes when WHO said something wrong, it's not that, you know, when they said there's no human to human transmission in January, (laughs) what they actually meant was there's no current evidence confirming human to human transmission. Not that there's evidence that, that, that shows there's no, I think there's, I think that is a key information and it gets lost. Like you don't have evidence yet that whether or not this is true. And I think that's what they should have said instead of there's no, there's none. And when you read there's none, it means, Oh, there's none. And when it quickly the again, the fog of war around this is just amazing. Um, we've never had this kind of thing. Normally science is always 
you know, solved in a back room, in a, not in a back room, but behind academia circles, and eventually prevented, presented yeah. as a guideline once the science kind of settles. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, we're, we're racing through this all. And again, not all scientists are good communicators. They're really good at, you know, explaining the new, nuance of their studies, but actually uh, communicating this, it's tricky. And they don't see politically um, the around the corner issue of, say, the Black Lives Matter. Um, you know how there was yeah, a lot of talk discussion. about that. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of discussion of did Black Lives Matter protests cause the epidemic? I, there's lots of evidence, the MBER and several other studies show that there's, it w- did not cause a spike. And you can also see it in the positivity rates in which Minnesota and Massachusetts aggressively tested protesters and their positivity rates were exactly the same, if not lower, than the general state population who did, who did not go to the protests. And so that, that also gives evidence. But what they did not realize, uh, by they, I mean the scientists in the public health community, is that on the outside, there's a hypocrisy of these lockdown protesters. Remember the lockdown protesters? <laughs> Feels like yeah. eons ago, but that was just a couple right. months ago. They didn't quite explain during the Black Lives Matter how it's different. You know, the lockdown protesters were not wearing masks, right? They were like shouting and going to state capitals like in Michigan, yeah. while Black Lives Matters were outdoors, majority wearing masks, except for the cops. A lot of the cops did not wear masks. Um, but they didn't explain it. And the reason, and the problem with that is around, it creates, it sets up a hypocrisy if you don't explain why, how they, this is different. They just said, Black Lives Matter. And yes, absolutely, I'm behind Black Lives Matter. But if you don't explain how it's different from the anti-lockdown, it, it just smacks of um, hypocrisy and, um, you know, cherry picking. And, it does. It does, and that, yeah. that requires, like, political, you have to, like, understand political optics and public PR and, uh, optics. And I think this optics was completely missed by a lot of the community um, in explaining this and seeing around the corner of, okay, if you say this, then next week or the month after, they're going to come back at you um, about X, Y, Z hypocrisy. And I think right now we're seeing that, whether it's the imprecision in the human-to-human transmission or the mask wearing. They weren't precise enough, and now... They, uh, it's, it's coming home to roost this, this, well, you said then this, now you say this, even though there's, there is a difference. There's, well, there's nuance yeah. and people generally miss it. Um, and you know, not to play devil's advocate, but like when you look at some of the media outlets and you see them demonizing people when they went to the beach, like I remember Florida opened in Jacksonville beaches and like, it was like, you're all going to kill your grandmothers, like, and they're all going to die. But these people, you know, whether they were socially distanced or not, I don't know, but they were outdoors. They were on a beach. They weren't wearing masks given, but then like two weeks later, the same pundits are on TV saying, you know, supporting, I guess the, the, the protests and stuff. And, and all these, these people are heroes. So that's just poor. Like, like you said, it's just, there's a, you can understand why somebody would get, would, would get misinformation or see a disconnect there. And then they, as we do in this country, take the jump to it's all a hoax. It's all crap. It's all the media. And sadly, that's just, credibility yeah. right. for being hypocrite, even though there is a slight nuance to the difference. But um, in terms of, you know, 15 seconds of, of headline, uh, you know, blazing, right. it yeah. gets lost. But now we have all this data that does point to maybe the fact that outdoors, socially distanced, and especially with a mask, you're really not at risk. I mean, is that pretty accurate at this point or tremendously so mask, less risk? Again, mask wearing is one of those, I will say mask wearing because you're at low risk, but it's about how many people around you wear it. Because cloth masks, because when we say masks, we mean cloth masks. So yeah. surgical masks Double are better stitched. than cloth. Yeah. And N95 are better than surgical. But cloth masks, they, their main function is to catch your cough. So if this was a mask, <coughs> it catches your droplets when you cough or talk because right. you're always spraying saliva. Right. 
cloth, that's the, that's the goal. So my, again, my mask protects you, your mask protects me. But if half the people are not wearing masks, then the protection, it, it's kind of a little bit like herd immunity. It works if huge numbers of people wearing masks and then the risk is reduced. So I would say, yes, outdoors, wear, wearing mask is lower risk. But I would say outdoors wearing mask if everyone or almost everyone wears a mask. Roundthex.com is one of my favorite companies in the entire crypto space. What they do is take all your small purchases and round them up to the nearest dollar and invest that spare change into any of over 30 crypto assets of your choice. They integrate with your favorite exchanges so that you can view various exchange balances all in one dashboard and round up into different assets all at the same time. And they do all this without ever holding any of your Bitcoin. This is by far the best way to dollar cost average into Bitcoin. Go to roundthex.com and use the promo code WOLF for $4 in free Bitcoin after making your first roundup or purchase. That's R-O-U-N-D-L-Y-X.com and code WOLF for $4 in free Bitcoin. Are you sick of paying ridiculous fees to trade crypto? It's time you try Voyager. It's hands down my favorite place to buy and trade crypto, and it's 100% commission free. Voyager gives you easy access to more than 30 top crypto assets, and you can instantly transfer cash from your bank account so you never miss a trading opportunity. Even better, you can now automatically earn interest on your crypto holdings. Currently, they're offering 5% interest on Bitcoin and 6% on USDC. Yes, you heard that correctly, 6%. And there are no limits or lockups, which means your funds always stay liquid. Find out why so many people are making the switch to Voyager. Visit investvoyager.com or search for Voyager on the iTunes or Google Play Store and get $25 in free Bitcoin when you use the promo code SCOTT25. That's investvoyager.com, promo code SCOTT25 for $25 in free Bitcoin and start trading today. Yeah, I think I read something like if 80% of the local population is wearing masks, it reduces the risk of spread by 90% or something like that. But if you dip even below 80%, those numbers go completely out, out of whack. Is that about accurate? Yeah, yeah. There, there is this exponential benefit where well, the higher you are um, past 75, 80%, the better it is, which is approximately the amount you need for herd immunity. So this is, it, there, there's a similar phenomenon where, you know, the, the transmission chain is cut off if there is 70, 80% blockade. And the blockade here is either immunity or, you know, droplet uh, blockade by a mask. So wear a mask. <laughs> Bottom yeah, line, but, just wear a mask. It's pretty easy. <laughs> it's so tricky. And this is why we need leadership. Because everywhere we, you know, Pence and Trump tour places, they almost never wear masks. Only Ever. once or twice have they worn a mask. Yeah. Um, and that's as a bad example. And members of Congress, Republican members of Congress, not wearing masks, getting infected. Uh, and again, governors, they need to wear masks. Like leadership, this is where leadership matters the most. How quickly are you going to do something? How aggressively are you going to set an example? Um, and, and in the most critical time in our society when we needed leadership, um, it's missing. I'm reminding of, of the best quote. I'm, I'm not sure if people have seen the movie, um, Kirk Douglas, um, uh, not Kirk Douglas, Michael Douglas movie, The American President. And Michael, Michael J. Fox is a scene. He says, Americans are so thirsty for leadership that they'll crawl to a mirage. And when they get there and they realize it's not there, they'll drink the sand. And Michael Douglas, President Shepard in the movie says, no, people don't drink the sand because they're thirsty. They drink the sand because they don't know the difference. And the difference here is leadership uh, and good evidence and science. And that's what people are looking for. And without that, again, you're drinking the sand of junk that is floating, whether it's misinformation or just opportunistic pundits or political hacks trying to polarize this. I mean, and, and that's a polite way of saying it because it's not like we're just lacking leadership. Our leadership is actually pushing the dangerous and opposite narrative of, of what needs to be pushed to, to save lives because it's an election year and the machismo that you discussed. But I mean, we don't have to go down 
that rabbit hole because I think you're, yeah, yeah. And I, I do. I just want to point out it's look, some people think it's like a purposeful dunk on Trump. No, it's not a dunk. I, I would, you know, I would criticize any leader who doesn't set these examples. It's just, we need, like, I would really beg, I would erect a monument and museum for Trump. If he would please set examples of wearing a mask being aggressive with contact tracing, funding the CDC more, um, give, invoking the Defense Production Act, I would happily give him a, a, a statue uh, to you know, calm his ego if he really wants a statue in a museum. Because I, I don't care about those things as much as I want to save lives. And everyone should come together on this. And, and I think that's, I think saving lives is the key part. It's not partisan. Wear a mask to save your neighbor. And so our kids can go to school. I mean, this should be like one of those, uh, you know, blockbuster disaster movies where aliens are attacking and everybody in the entire world comes together to, to fight it. And it's just not the way, you know, <laughs> Will Smith and his fighter jet attacking the aliens, but it's, it's been almost the opposite. It's very, you know, uh, it's very tribal and very separated and, and politicized. And to me, it's just, it's really sad, but hopefully uh, we will be able to overcome that soon and, and, and beat this thing. But um, I want to talk about antibodies and immunity. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of misinformation or I think the nature of obviously a novel virus, it's called novel for a reason. We just don't know. But wh where do we stand now with serology, with understanding the chance that you would be immune if you'd had it before, uh, you know, antibodies, things like that? Um, yeah, I think the antibody thing is evolving very quickly. We know that um, you get antibodies if you're infected. Or you can, um, but, but, but the problem is that there's two kinds of antibodies. There's uh, neutralizing antibodies, and there's antibodies that bind to the virus, but not necessarily neutralizing. Um, and so in, in vaccines, you're trying to find the neutralizing. And, and I think, you know, some of the vaccine trials are finding that we are going to find it. The other issue is antibodies that they do disappear after a couple months, it seems, after like two, three, four months, depending on which study. And some people are saying, well, that, does that mean your immunity disappears? I don't think so, because um, the, the antibodies, they naturally disappear. For, by disappear, I mean your body actually has like a library archive. It's called your B memory cells. And these B memory cells store um, a repository of the recipe for these antibodies against various pathogens that you've encountered in your life. And so this is why kids get sick all the time initially, because they're learning each time they get infected. And adults who have good robust uh, immune systems, they've learned all this in their life. And so their library of, re of antibody recipes against previous viruses is, and path bacteria is much, is, is much better. That said, um, you know, this library, some people say it's, it's, a, it's a capacity it's, and people have different capacities. And this is where, you know, I'm not um, an expert, um, you know, I'm not, a, by the way, I want to clarify, I'm not a virology or immunology expert, but th this is my general understanding from um, what I've studied and, um, and obviously what the ongoing discussion that I've been monitoring closely has been. And I think you will have, even if the antibodies disappear, you will have some sort of immunity. But that also um, means that these antibody tests, which try to find these antibodies, after three, four months, you're going to miss the fact that you actually had these antibodies and, um, and actually have them stored away, again, not below detection levels. So, you know, if you do a test from six months from now, and your antibody is negative, you could have actually already had it, but it just it di it disappeared by then. Um, uh, so it's really hard that's to a say. Better, that's a better scenario. <laughs> yeah, having the immunity in a negative but, test is a better scenario than a positive test and you're not immune. Yeah. So I would say like there's, there's false positive, false negative, 
and it's a true negative, but it's just you're past the window to find right. it. Right. Um, yeah, that makes so, sense. So this is why I'm saying the immunity passports are not the answer because they don't give you a definitive answer. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful for con- convalescent plasma trials. I think convalescent plasma, is, it's been well shown in many, many previous uh, viruses. As a treatment. As a treatment, yeah. Um, and and it, I think you can, I would say, antibody testing for, uh, you know, a potential donor for convalescent plasma is, is valid. Um, but... Again, the, the best is obviously to check, to use the convalescent plasma of someone who's directly recovered. Um, but I think immunity, let's wait. I think the vaccines will be here s- relatively soon. There's a lot of vaccine trials that are ongoing, and these vaccine trials take about one to two months. Oh, I mean, like the phase threes or some of trial, like yeah. two and three combos. Like China's already approved one after a phase two. Yeah, for the military, and then they're testing the military. on the military. <laughs> I don't know. It's Chinese Yikes. military, it's just... <laughs> in certain ways, you know, the other thing China could be doing, and this is speculation, but they could be approving them so that they could bypass some ethics and do challenge trials. Right. And the challenge, uh, challenge tests are actually what we do to animals like monkeys and uh, chimps is uh, they, we give them a shot and then we actually give them the virus like a, a month, a few weeks or a month later, see if they're immune to it or not. We don't do randomized, fancy uh, randomized trials with monkeys and, and chimps. Um, the researchers directly give them the virus. And these challenge trials give you results much faster and much more definitively right. and efficiently with very small sample size. You can get your answer. Um, right. In certain ways, by China doing this, they, they could be setting themselves with challenge tests. I don't know for sure. Like it's, it's, I would, we I would can't say, do that here, you're saying. No, it is too unethical to give, to give someone the virus directly. On purpose, right. Right. And again, the, the vaccine is not proven to work yet. So if you give someone the virus, it is the most unethical thing. Um, people are debating it. And, um, and well, know, even if it works, the side effects from the vaccine could also be a killer that you don't know about yet. So no, well, it's well, mu- well, multiple well, layers why, of risk. Yeah. Yeah. This is why it's right. supposed to work. So years right. ago, there was a, a scientist. So he discovered H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori. It's the virus that gives you um, uh, uh, hepatitis um, right. uh, and, various ca- and various stomach cancers and, uh, and other cancers. And people did not believe that it was, a vi- it was a virus causing a cancer. At that point in time, they did not believe it. And so he found this bacteria that, um, oh, sorry, the, the virus then uh, it causes um, cancer. Uh, and he put it in himself. Like, he just like, okay, I want to prove that it causes these cell mutations. I'm going to put it in my body directly. So he's a scientist. He can do it to himself. But, but that kind of challenge kind of thing is really risky and un- unethical to do to other people. And so Believe it or not, I know someone who did that. Um, grow, growing up, my uh, high school girlfriend's father was a very famous physician. His name was uh, Dr. Ken Heilman, and he was studying Parkinson's. And uh, he developed a drug called L-DOPA, which has been used forever. But before it was approved, he and his partner, they did the trial in mice. The mice survived. They gave it to themselves, and the mice died the next day. So they went through this whole, it was like a famous, uh, famous thing. I can't remember the exact details, but, and they gave it to themselves and they were worried that they were going to die. Obviously it worked out, uh, worked out fine and the medication was used, but they, they actually did that. This was probably in the 1980s, maybe early nineties. I can't remember, but you're right. I mean, scientists do that to themselves sometimes to, uh, pr- prove themselves right. It's pretty yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And H. pylori, I just want to clarify is a bacteria as, as I yeah. initially said, but it's a bacteria that, that, um, that causes a gastrointestinal uh, gastric cancer. Um, so it's it's actually the one of the strongest known risk factor for gastric cancer. Again, it's because he d- directly infected himself with it. Um, right. It it 
And at the time, people thought he was crazy for hypothesizing that this could cause cancer. But it's really unethical. So we should wait for a trial. And we cannot rush it. And then the, the China, China's run, they're running some of their trials in UAE right now. And the Oxford group is running their trial in Brazil. And there's several other, um, there's a dozen other trials out there um, for a vaccine. So we will find a vaccine, I'm pretty sure. There's okay. many different types. There's, you know, the, the Oxford group is using the adenovirus um, vector, uh, which is uh, another way of creating the, the, the vaccine. Well, uh, China is using the, the inactivated um, and the attenuated virus. So I think we will find it. It's just a matter of time. It will be effective to some degree. That is the ultimate exit strategy. So makes sense. Um, I want to talk about data because uh, it's been, it's funny, even facts are controversial these days. Um, every time there's a new study or a new anything, the data, people question it. They say it's faked. They're undercounting. The hospitals are getting paid to report COVID deaths, all these things. So we've seen an obvious and huge spike in positive cases, right? That, that's pretty clear whether that's a function of more testing or not. We're seeing in positivity rates, so that's probably not the case. But people love to point to the fact that deaths are dropping in this country while cases are rising. What's the explanation for that? The explanation is the lag. That's what I think. The lag, it it takes anywhere from three to four weeks. And then there's the reporting lag also. And then it's based on death certificates or something, right? So it can take weeks for, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes like New New Jersey actually did a big data dump of like 1700 cases this week of cases that happened like weeks ago. Right. Um, So the, the, the lag is big. And also the lag also depends you know, the lag is shorter in countries that do testing much earlier than testing. If you test only those who are shorter as a breath, it's a shorter lag than if you right. just test someone yes. at the top. If you have testing only people who are hospitalized, it's an even shorter lag. Uh, lag. And then um, also, uh, if, if it's elderly, the, the lag is much shorter than if, if you find the same person with a cough who's young. And so oftentimes I would say like, given that half the cases are under 35, you would have to wait, you know, obviously some of them will get sick directly and die, but it's, it's low. You will have to wait until they transmit it again to someone else before the mortality goes up, uh, given how many young people, but, and also the, there is treatments have gotten better. We know how to, you know, fine tune the ventilator um, pressure a little better. Uh, we know it's a clotting disease, so a lot of doctors are using anticoagulants a lot aggressively. Um, we know that dexamethasone works. Remdesivir shortens the duration and improves um, how quickly people recover. So I think there, we know, this epidemic is so different now than when it hit first hit New York or right. Italy, when back then people were still like grasping at straws at what is this virus and right. what is it doing to us. And then, and all the different dimensions around it. But uh, it will, ca- I guarantee it will catch up with us in a few weeks. And, yeah, that, that's and we're actually good. already seeing it. In Mississippi, it's already ticking up. Arizona, it's our, the mortality is already ticking up, um, I think. And so, you know, there, we, there's no getting around it. Um, it will happen. It will be maybe a little bit gentler of a mortality curve than New York, but it will definitely right. happen. And also, it depends, like, are, is, if it's, the cases are surging 10% a week versus ten, cases are surging 90 to 150% a week, that, is, that surge is going to over capac- go over the hospital capacity. Right? Right. If you go over hospital capacity, then the mortality will stack up much quicker than um, if it's a gentle rise. And in Taiwan, there's almost no one who's died in Taiwan. Um, because they have so few cases, and every case is meticulously monitored and treated. And so they get the best treatment. Well, and if you're overwhelmed, people start dying in gurneys in the hallways. So what's the uh, pie in the sky? We know it's not going to happen, but what's the answer in a country like the United States? It's seeing this huge spike. The curve is, is going up. I mean, is it a 
full shutdown again, in theory, is that what works? Or is it everyone wears a mask and, you know, doesn't gather indoors? I mean, what should we be doing in an ideal situation? I think what we should do is, look, shutdowns are incredibly painful. Yeah. And make people, make them see, are we, do we want to do a full shutdown of our lives? Or do you want to wear a mask and do things outdoors? So I would avoid indoor uh, things as much as possible um, and keep it outside with masks and try to distance and airlines. I shouldn't, I United airlines and American, if you're listening, please leave the, the, the seat in the middle empty. That's so um, I think, I think it is a very safe precaution to do. Um, uh, cause in certain ways, I personally think that if you offer to book the seats 100%, you might actually get less bookings because people know that you're offering every single seat booking. They, they will rather book an airline in which has an empty middle seat. So I actually right. think it's committed. It might just avoid you completely. Yeah. Yeah. But it actually, it actually has the opposite effect. Um, I think that's the goal because we need to get this under control for our kids, not just for deaths, which is absolutely critical, but for our kids so they go back to school. And the diseases has such high morbidity uh, um, in addition to mortality. Um, so again, I think that we have to create some sacrifices um, until the vaccine arrives. Um, and I'm hopeful the vaccine will offer you know, as high protection as quickly as possible. And that is universally affordable because right, that's a huge issue. Right. Of course. Do you think that can really happen by the end of the year? Like Trump had said months ago? No, it will. Yeah. We will have limited supplies for, for uh, first responders, healthcare workers, essential workers. I, I think personally that grocery store workers and yeah. um, and a lot of people who work on the front lines should get yeah um, people who are vaccine. working in them food food f- plants and delivering yeah, exactly. yeah I mean come on yeah if you invoke the Defense Production Act you should give them the vaccine um, but uh, again I think we should be invoking the Defense Production Act for you know N95 masks and other PPEs instead of burgers and sausages to be honest but but you know the agriculture industry is suffering a lot everyone is suffering and. And, and I, this is why like epidemiology and public health scientists are, are in a really rock, a tough rock and a hard place, almost as much as if not more than political, because political people, they can say, well, I listen to the experts. Right. They blame the you. The experts <laughs> have to basically like, it's, it's choosing between two extremely difficult things. And this is why the, the problem is a lot of, scientists out there they're really great at explaining their science but they don't understand politics and seeing around the corner around what is going to happen next on the political horizon um what is the uh, counter attacks um what is what is the optics for the lay public around this and um you know i, I left academia I had a very long academia career, but I left it because I saw that, you know, scientists, there, there's a science translation aspect. And I, I know I'm getting really dense, but the issue is, you know, it's a fine. lot of scientists are creating the missteps and that we're having to clean it up. And a lot of the scientists are being torpedoed and being fired or being forced to resign or threatened with death, um, death threats. Yeah. Because, you know, it, you're giving you're really giving really complicated results and, um, you know, mask mandates that creates the public backlash that, uh, look, no one else uh, wants to make these recommendations, but we kind of have to in the, in the aim of saving lives. And if you go pro-business, you're going to kill people. And in the end, you're also going to ruin your career and reputation or destroy the public in some way. So it is, it is an extremely tough situation. And that's what I'm saying. If everyone just wears masks and again, ignore the misinformation out there. If everyone wears masks, 
90%, we could get this in our control. And it's, it's a respect for others. That's And within months, right? I mean, we're not talking about controlling it in years. We're talking about... Yeah, we don't have controlled. to wait until next year yeah. when, the, when hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine are available and given out to everyone. We can do it within a few months. Czech Republic did it, and they put a mask law for everyone. Within a few weeks, few months, the epidemic was almost gone. And now kids are back in school in the Czech Republic. And kids are back in school in uh, Faroe Islands. Kids are back yeah. in school in, in Central Europe. And, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very jealous of that. What would it take for you to send your kids back to school? I would look at the, I think the key thing is look at the local transmission, not just the state level. Go to your State Department of Health website. Look at your county. And if your county is really big, look in your zip code or your right. neighborhood and see what is the positivity rate in your area. If the positivity rate is really, really low, as in like under 5%, I think it's pretty safe. The pos under 10, and if it's under 10%, I'm like, it's decently safe. If it's over 10%, 15%, oh, you know, it becomes like really tricky. Should I send my kids there? But right. also, does it? How much of it depends on the steps that the schools are taking? Like, if let's say we're below five percent, right. exactly. well, if we're below five percent, that doesn't mean like everyone goes back to a, a crowded public school like normal, right? Uh, what does the school right. need to be doing on the on the other yeah. side? And that is a really uh, good uh, statement there. And I, I wanted to clarify: it. schools obviously need to be very vigilant. Some schools are thinking about half the kids on alternate days or a and pm. Um, right. You know, kind of like kindergarten. Um, it's not optimal, but it's it might be necessary. Um, kids wearing masks, you know, at all times, in addition to teachers. There's a lot of proposals, and you know, building uh, building ventilation, improving the 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 filtration, as well as potentially in installing UV um, sanitization in the um, in the into HVAC system. I think all these That's things need to be done, but uh, again, it's it's everyone else has a different level of risk. If I say it's okay, some people, if you have an immunocompromised child who has, I have a friend who has a kid who got a an organ transplant for their cancer. You know, my recommendation is not what he should be following. Right. right, of course. It's, it, it's everything's individualized. Has, yeah, my, my my kid has asthma or has some extreme respiratory or inflam inflammatory disease. I would be much more careful than if my kid was healthy. Um, so everyone has different risk thresholds, and the local local school district is very different in different approaches. Right, in right. terms of how much you know sanit sanitization and UV, you know lamps and um, not UV lamp, but UV um, irradiation in their HVAC system can they install? Not every school can. So again, it's very tough and it's very local specific, but I think the key first key is look at the, what is the positivity percentage in your local area in zip code? That makes sense. So, I mean, I guess parting words before we're done. What, what is the moral of the story here? How, you know, uh, is there anything else that you want to make sure that people know before, before we go? I think, you know, we will get through this. It, it is one of those things that will test our civilization's ability to come together because we need to do things collectively to protect ourselves. And and we have to be super vigilant against all the misinformation out there. Please, please don't, you know, just listen to um, a random person who's proselytizing about something. I, just listen to your public health, health leaders. Don't demonize them. They're trying to, their best. And for individual families, I think just look at what is your personal family's risk profile and risk tolerance, um, and, and altogether, wear a mask. And vaccines, Thanks. please take them when they come out. Um, and I'm pretty sure Fauci will be quite a hawk in making sure that there is no 
like an unsafe vaccine will not be released prematurely. Right. Because, yeah, I agree. Um, there's some people talking about October surprise around that, but I don't, I don't think about you or the NIH. The, or, the or, election or, vaccine, or, right? Of course. No, I, I think we will get through this. It's, but again, it's ask your neighbor who may or may not be a pro mask or may or may not think that this is real is if you want your kid to go back to school, please do everything you can. I think that is the best message for the kids. Yeah. Ultimately is, is the, is the takeaway, not just yourself. Think of your kids. I love it. So uh, where should everybody follow you uh, moving forward? And we'll probably have to have you again in three months. <laughs> <laughs> I hope in three months that we're not talking about. Different coverage. Oh, no, much worse we've gotten. Here, yeah. we are, here we are again. Um, I'm hoping if we come back in three months, it's like, you know, we can talk about how we can uh, move forward, you know, in the after times. Yeah. Of this. But, you know, follow me on Twitter. Uh, I also have a, a direct SMS line that people can also contact me. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, and it's the, the direct line is, um, let me get the number right here. It's 703-552-5771. 703-552-5771 and just text join. And I sometimes send out uh, updates there. But... Again, don't just listen to me. Listen to other public health officials. Trust Fauci and realize no one's perfect in this fog of war. But please listen to those who do, have, do not have any financial or political <laughs> motives. So. Yeah, that really is the, the bottom line. Well, thank you again so much for uh, taking the time and for being a voice of reason uh, against a... I, I see Twitter. So against a tidal wave of uh, trolling, hatred, and, and, and negativity, it, it, people I don't think appreciate how difficult it is to stay the course with a positive message in a, in a no. situation like this. So we really appreciate that you you do that. And yeah. uh, we'll look forward to doing this again down the road with a much more uh, positive conversation. Yeah. Thanks. Stay safe. Thank you. Let's